set of decisions that the scope of which, the magnitude of which, could not have been comprehended at that time. I remember them when they came down. We had no children yet at that point. Marilyn and I were married. Um, but at that age in life and not having any experience with the impact of such a decision, America didn't have that experience. The way we analyzed that thing didn't, didn't understand how severe this would be. And yet, once the decision came down, there's something that I've learned, Mr. Speaker, and that is that people say you can't legislate morality. And so I've always thought that was a pretty weak statement and not very defensible, but you hear it quite often. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. Well, legislation is a reflection of morality. I mean, for example, we have laws against murder and rape and, and assault and battery and armed robbery, and the list goes on and on of the things that are prohibited. They are the reflections of the morality of a nation. And the lack of the legislation would, reflect, would um, indicate only one of two things. Either it's a lack of morality or it's a nation that doesn't need laws to frame it because the morality of the nation is so enshrined in the culture that there doesn't need to be laws. Uh, for example, one of, those examples, one of those examples would be that for centuries, marriage was between a man and a woman. We didn't need laws that said so because everybody knew that marriage defined a union between a man and a woman. In my case, uh, joined together in holy matrimony. And so uh, as the legislation came forward, and I was in the Iowa Senate at the time, I remember some of that debate and discussion, and it was, why do we need to pass this law to defend marriage, the Defense of Marriage Act? And I helped write part of that language, Mr. Speaker, and, and I had a little hard time explaining why it was important that we move it, more or less uh, an insurance policy, so that we could protect marriage in Iowa against the movement that had just begun, not very much earlier than that, by litigation out in Hawaii. And then the conflation between civil unions and marriage, but the reflection of the values of marriage were in our culture so deeply that senator after senator stood on the floor and said, why do we need to do this? This is a redundant exercise. It's a waste of our time. Everybody knows that marriage is between a man and a woman. And we passed the Defense of Marriage Act. There were only about three or four that voted against it. We wondered why they did that. They were out there in the, in the fringes, we th so we thought at the time. That was about 1998. And by 2009, and that would only be 11 years later, the United States Supreme Court came down with a, or excuse me, the Iowa Supreme Court came down with the decision, uh, Varnum v. Brian, which imposed same-sex marriage on Iowa, the transformation of a culture that, ref that needed a law to protect marriage if we were to protect it. But once for thousands of years, well, I'll say at least yeah, thousands of years, marriage was between a man and a woman, and it changed. So when something became permissive, then the permissiveness of it changed the morality of the situation. And that is not a very good description, Mr. Speaker, of what happened with the abortion circumstances in America. We understood then that life begins at the moment of conception, but when Roe versus Wade came down with a decision that said that, that prohibited the states from regulating abortion and prohibiting abortion, then it became permissible and permissive, and it became pervasive in the same time. So with some of our peak incidents of abortion got up in by time from 1973 until the latter part of that decade, up to 1.6 million abortions a year. And Today, after 45 years of Roe versus Wade, this nation has seen 60 million, some say 61 million babies aborted. Babies that would be growing up in our society today, going to school, playing ball, studying, going to church, loving their brothers and sisters, their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles. They're gone. 60 million little babies gone. And not only 60 million, there's no way to actually describe 60 million babies as only, but in addition, there are another roughly 60 million that were not born because their mothers were aborted. And a population between 100 and 120 million Americans are missing today 
because of Roe versus Wade's decision and and Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, and an unsoundly and unjustly decision that came down from the United States Supreme Court. And one of the problems we have in this country is we have three branches of government. A lot of government teachers and constitutional teachers instruct that it's three co-equal branches of government, but that's not what our founding fathers expected. They defined it instead as that, this, that the judicial branch of government would be the weakest of the three branches of government. And yet, our society, our culture, our civilization gives such reverence to the United States Supreme Court that they can't even get their minds around the idea, what do you do if the court comes down with an atrocious, outrageous, erroneous, non-constitutional decision that visits 60 million deaths of innocent babies on our country, on our country and another 60 million babies that are not born because as a result of it, a missing 100 to 120 million babies decision of the Supreme Court, and what do we do? We accept the decision as if the, sac if, if the decisions of the Supreme Court are utterly sacrosanct, and the only way they can ever change is if the circumstances of that court should change in such a way that the appointments and the confirmations to the court could transform and reverse the erroneous decisions in the past. Now, there are circumstances where the Supreme Court has reversed their own decision, we had a Dred Scott decision that actually wasn't reversed, and that was a decision on slavery, and some say that that was an erroneous, poorly found decision. And I think I side with Abraham Lincoln that it was constitutional at its time, probably was a decision that conformed to the Constitution, however morally wrong it was. And then along came the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendments that rectified the situation that was put upon us by, by Dred Scott. And, by the way, 600,000 lives lost in the Civil War, putting an end to slavery and resolving the, the Union. Was the Union going to be something that one could separate from? Or once you're part of the Union, are you always part of the Union? And, as this turned out, 600,000 Americans were killed in the Civil War putting an end to slavery. 600,000. Sounds like a lot to you compare it to 60 million babies aborted, Mr. Speaker. This is the worst atrocity ever, the cumulative effect of it, the worst atrocity ever committed on American soil. And it was sanctified by the Supreme Court in an unsoundly founded decision. And now the, the thing that obstructs us from getting to, from, from getting pro-life legislation passed is a few people that profess that they are pro-life, some pro-life, a pro-life organization, they say, well, we have to respect the Supreme Court decision, and that it is sacrosanct, that the Supreme Court laid out the parameters of viability, not only uh, Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, but also um, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, this viability concept, which is that if a baby can't survive outside the womb, is really not a life. Well, we know better than that because we can hear their hearts beat. We can watch them move around inside the womb. We can watch them squirm. We can watch them suck their thumb. We can watch them move their lips like they're trying to talk. We bond with these babies now through ultrasound. The ultrasound is just about as good as Skype with our, with our children and grandchildren that are out here breathing this free air. That's the circumstances that have changed. We know that it is life. The Supreme Court's decision wasn't soundly found. They weren't looking at an ultrasound then, back 45 years ago. We didn't know whether we had twins or, or singles or triplets or quadruplets then because we didn't have enough ability to even listen to the heartbeat precisely enough. Today we can, Mr. Speaker. Today we're listening to heartbeats and today we're watching babies squirm and move and suck their thumb and move their mouth like they're trying to talk and get their exercise inside the womb. Now we know, we can't deny. It's not a blob of tissue. It's not some kind of an intruder. This is a unique, unique DNA, innocent, unborn human life. And we brought legislation here to this Congress called the Heartbeat Legislation, H.R. 490. And in this legislation, it says this, that before an abortionist 
uh, sets about committing an abortion, he must first check for a heartbeat with transabdominal ultrasound, which picks up a heartbeat between seven and eight weeks from fertilization, fertilization or conception. He must first check for a heartbeat. If a heartbeat is detected, the baby is protected. And now this rings not only in our hearts, but it rings true in our conscience because we know that where there's a heartbeat, there's life. And we know that if you go in and surgically or by any other method, snuff out that heartbeat, you're snuffing out life. The most innocent among us. Father uh, Jonathan Morris, a priest from New York that we see on Fox News in the morning, um, one day he was commenting, he was commenting about how the ladies and the mothers in the church, when their babies start to cry too loud, they get up and hustle them out of the church. And he said, why would you do that? Those are the only innocent voices in that church. Well, the most innocent are in the womb. And the most innocent have been victimized by this idea of convenience or women's rights or that it's not somebody else's business to tell someone else what to do with their body. Well, it isn't about their body, Mr. Speaker. It's about that unique being with that unique combination of DNA. And that's how precious this is. We never know the potential of a baby, an innocent unborn baby. But there was a story in the news a couple of days ago. Now, there are those who would predict that inside the womb, you can identify Down syndrome. You can identify other afflictions. And those other afflictions, um, they might argue, make that baby less than perfect. But those babies, when they're loved, are perfect for those who love them. And we can't decide with a level of certainty regardless when they're in the womb. If there's a heartbeat there, that's an innocent life that's deserving of protection. And if we would not end that life of that baby outside the womb, we would not end it and should not end it inside the womb. And so if a heartbeat is detected, the baby is protected. H.R. 490 has 171 co-sponsors here in the House of Representatives. It's come further and faster than any significant piece of pro-life legislation, I believe, since 1973 in Roe v. Wade in the first place. And we need to get this bill to the floor of this House and send it over and put it on Mitch McConnell's desk. There's hardly any room left on Mitch McConnell's desk these days. That number must be up to 500 or so bills sitting on his desk. But we can put heartbeat there on top of Mitch McConnell's desk. And you know, when you do that, that's the highest priority. Whatever it is on top of the desk is the highest priority. And we can say to Mitch, bring this thing out to the floor of the Senate and send heartbeat up to the president's desk. And if you can't do that, Send the president to the states where the Democrats that will vote no on it are running for office and remind them that America is now a pro-life nation. And this pro-life nation wants to pass pro-life legislation. And if they can't do it with the senators that are seated over there now, they can do it with the senators that can be seated over there next January. And I believe that the conscience of America will be reflected if we send that over and put the bill on Mitch McConnell's desk. Here's the polling that we have also. I mean, there are some people that worry about public opinion. They should know their conscience and act by, off their conscience, but off of public opinion, it works this way. The heartbeat bill, HR 490, we have a Barna poll that was conducted actually uh, February of last year, but um, it says this, that 86% of Republicans support the heartbeat bill without exceptions, and 61% of independents support it without exceptions, and 55% of Democrats support the heartbeat bill without exceptions. That's an astonishing thing to see that we have a majority of Democrats. I would call that a landslide if I won by 55% or more. Well, this is the equivalent of a landslide among Democrats where we do have a Democrat or two or three that will vote for this bill, but for the most part, that's been polarized here also. We used to have as many as 60 different pro-life Democrats that would come in and vote on pro-life legislation. Now I count maybe three. I hope that number's more. 
I regret that the parties have gotten this polarized, but some of this stuff happened. We lost some pretty good Democrats when they had to walk the plank to vote for Obamacare, and the people that replaced them were conservative Republicans. It's one of the reasons we have so many co-sponsors here on the Republican side. 171 co-sponsors here, and 162 national organizations or leaders have signed on. I noticed that uh, Reverend Franklin Graham sent out a tweet in support of heartbeat legislation here a couple of days ago. I'm a great admirer, respecter of Reverend Graham, and I believe that his moral barometer is uh, matches that of any mortal. So the support for this bill has come along well, and I'll circle back to the resistance that we have that we need to overcome yet, Mr. Speaker, but while uh, we reached a plateau on the heartbeat bill, it became apparent to me that having one line in the water, however good that line is in the water here in the House of Representatives behind H.R. 490, it was also important to get some other lines in the water. And the one thing that I could do was to take the heartbeat bill and offer it up to the Iowa legislature. So I had a conversation with um, Congressman, or excuse me, with State State Senator Brad Zahn. He had a shot and would have made a good congressman. But uh, he is chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Iowa Senate today. Had that conversation with him and a conversation with Senator Jason Schultz. And they took the heartbeat legislation and brought that into the Iowa Senate. And uh, that draft of that legislation was adapted to uh, uh, a bit of a degree so to conform to the state legislature. And they worked that bill around through their caucus a little bit. And the chairman of the Judiciary Committee there, uh, Senator Brad Zahn, uh, said, I'm bringing this bill through committee. And he was keeping me up to speed with what was going on. So that was an intense hearing before the committee. And I'm just going to speak on what I hear back channel, uh, not that I was in the room. There were some people that wanted to uh, stage a protest against the heartbeat bill. And so the chairman of the Judiciary Committee looked at them before he gaveled in the committee and said, anybody come here to protest, raise your hand, I'll throw you out now. Um, I liked his approach. There was uh, no need to throw anybody out because they actually behaved. And so um, there was a quiet but an intense hearing and markup before the Iowa Senate Judiciary Committee. And the Republicans all voted for the heartbeat bill. And then uh, here it sits on the calendar of the floor of the Iowa Senate. And now the next big milestone needed to be reached, and, and that is that the uh, majority leader, Bill Dix, um, brought the topic up before the caucus, and that's closed doors, so I'm only speculating on what uh, I picked up also back channel, um, Mr. Speaker. But he said to the, to the 29 Republicans seated there in the caucus, is there anybody here that doesn't want to vote for this heartbeat bill? Uh, no one raised their hand. So the decision was made, we'll bring it to the floor. Well, it had been assigned to the, the chair of the subcommittee for the bill was uh, Amy Sinclair. And Amy Sinclair was um, put together the, the subcommittee effort, prepared herself for an intense debate. And it was uh, expected to be an intense debate. I pointed out to her that my first debate on the floor of the Iowa Senate took me seven and a half hours before I got my bill passed. It was official English, by the way. It was a long, hard slog, to, to quote Rumsfeld. Uh, but um, hers was entirely different. I, I thought there would be six, seven, eight, ten hours of debate. And uh, she brought the bill up, made eloquent opening remarks, rebutted a few of the remarks that were made on the other side, and 24 minutes later, uh, the vote went up on the board, 30 to 20, the uh, independent voted also, and his name is David Johnson, uh, voted for the heartbeat bill in the Iowa Senate, along with all 29 Republican senators, 30 to 20 on 24 minutes of debate, and it rocketed over to the House of Representatives. And once again, I had the uh, misconception of thinking to myself, this is going to be easy. Um, but like a lot of things in life, it isn't that easy. And uh, so as uh, we began to see how the bill was going to move, if it moved at all in the, in the Iowa House, what I learned was that they didn't think they could move it. They didn't think they had the votes. And um, the, uh, the first whip check card that we worked on there was 35, we needed 51 votes. There's 100 Iowa House in the Iowa House. And of the, of the 51 votes we needed, we only had 35. And so a bunch of us went to work. 
And uh, by the way, one of the people at the top of my list to thank here in this congressional record tonight, Mr. Speaker, is the Iowa representative of National Right to Life who is uh, not supporting this bill at the national level, and they need to lead, follow, or get out of the way. But their Iowa representative's name is Scott Valencia, and he's of Iowa Right to Life. And he was magnificent in the work that he did and the strategy that unfolded and in the network that he had put together with the pro-life community within Iowa. I could always count on Scott being at the center, the nexus of the communications on who was thinking what, who was saying what, and helping to inform us in the spreadsheet we put together to whip the votes. And, and also on that list would be from the, uh, the family leader, um, well, uh, Bob Vanderplatz, uh, whom I've campaigned a lot with, and we worked together to, um, to uh, vote three Supreme Court justices off the Iowa bench. And he and his team at the family leader, including Chuck Hurley, longtime friend, and Danny Carroll, former representative, were uh, stellar in their efforts in focusing on how we would pull the votes together in the Iowa House. And then we had, um, there are 32 organizations in the Iowa Pro-Life Coalition. Those are the organizations that I referenced, Scott Valencia kept his finger on that pulse, but many of these are people that I've worked with for years. It goes back 20 or more years on this issue. And I'm so proud of the work that they did. And our, uh, our former majority leader here in the United States House of Representatives, Tom DeLay, made the trip up to Iowa to testify uh, in favor of the heartbeat bill before, before a hearing in the Iowa House of Representatives, along with Dr. Kathy Altman, who was a witness for us here in Congress as well, Mr. Speaker. So I'm very, very grateful to all of these folks and many more. But the jobs that they did, um, the jobs that they did help move this thing in the right direction. The hearing was intense, and uh, there was strong testimony on both sides. But the voice for the unborn, the voice for the most innocents, prevailed in that hearing, and it gave more confidence to some of the people, some of the people that uh, were reluctant to vote in favor of the bill on that night. And one of those people, I suspect, and I suspect only, uh, would be uh, Dave Heaton, who I count as a good friend. And I've always enjoyed him and had a certain affection for the affable gentleman uh, who cut so many prime ribs down there in his restaurant in southeast Iowa. Uh, but when he voted yes coming out of committee, he said yes for now, and I thought that was maybe the end of it. But it turned out that we needed 51 votes, so we wouldn't have him if it hadn't been for the vote of Dave Heaton uh, as he retires. And God bless you, Dave. I appreciate your vote. And um, I appreciate the vote and the work of so many there in the House, including Speaker Upmeyer, uh, who is uh, second generation speaker of the House of Representatives, who has earned her place there and has become a very stable and a master strategist on how to move legislation through the, uh, through the legislature, along with Majority Leader Chris Hagenow, who was fully behind the heartbeat bill from the beginning, and uh, I think kept a low profile publicly, but did a lot behind the scenes. And then uh, another individual whose character I know well, and that's the Speaker Pro Tem, Matt Winshuttle, uh, who um, has been part of this strategy all along. A very, very steady hand, a very, very clear strategist, somebody you want to ride the river with. And um, he, does, um, he does come from over there in the river bottom, not very far from me. And I appreciate the strategy and the work that each of these individuals did. But this, uh, this doesn't stop at this point either, Mr. Speaker. And the chairman of the Human Resources Committee, Joel Fry, uh, did um, master work on it, as well as the floor manager in the Iowa House, Shannon Lundgren. And um, uh, Shannon, I believe, is in her first term. And I haven't gotten to know her personally, but here's the narrative that I get from the way she managed that debate in the House. It was a lot longer in the House. It went on for hours, five to seven hours, something like that, perhaps more. The bill passed around um, 1130 that night. And, um, and Shannon, when she brought the bill up, there were, this is the critique that came to me, is that she started out slow 
and you might start to wonder if she was going to be able to hold her own through that very, very grueling trial that had been assigned to her that she was, I think, eager and proud to take on, and she should be proud because she got stronger as the night wore on, and uh, so did a number of the other members of the Iowa House. <clears throat> and so they stepped up to defend their positions and to advocate their narratives. And uh, one of them would be Steve Holt, uh, who was, uh, he and also Sandy Salmon, who had introduced her own bill, her own pro-life legislation. Uh, they strong and many others strong in the way they handled their debate. And I didn't put together a, a complete analyzed list here, Mr. Speaker, because, well, one thing, I just didn't have the time, but I recognize the risk in naming names. There definitely are people that I've left out. There'll be others that I'll try to thread in here that um, I have, uh, but there'll always be people that are left out. And uh, some of them in the middle of this, though, Jack Whitfer, who uh, is um, the, the, the um, leader in the Iowa Senate, and I mentioned Amy Sinclair, the, the chair of the subcommittee and the floor manager in the Senate, but Senator Brad Zahn, uh, who, um, whom I've talked with a lot and grown to admire, and I appreciate his drive. He doesn't hesitate, he doesn't equivocate, he knows what he believes, and he strategizes and acts upon it. And Senator Jason Schultz, whom I first brought up this topic with. But um, I want to thank... I want to thank every representative and every senator who spoke and who voted uh, for the heartbeat bill in the Iowa legislature. It was a phenomenal accomplishment. Last year, they passed the 20 week called the, sometimes the pain capable bill. Many thought that would be the end of the effort on, on pro-life for a while. And they came back this year and passed heartbeat legislation. And not only was it the work, not only was it the debate, uh, not only was it the negotiations and the votes that were counted and the effort on the whip team from the, from the, those elected members who worked inside the House of Representatives and the Senate, but also the outside groups, the 32 outside organizations and then some that came together. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal effort that brought this together. I wanted to say also, a couple of a couple of words about how difficult this was for some of the most pro-life people that we had uh, because I'm not one who believes in exceptions I don't believe that that a that a baby that is a product of a rape should be executed for the crime of their father um, and neither do I believe that that should be the case for a baby who is the product of incest which might be the crime of the father, and it might be the crime of the father and the mother. Uh, but those babies are innocent, and they should have every right to life of every other baby conceived at any other time under any other circumstances. But it came to that place where there were either going to be exceptions or there was going to be no bill passed. And I think there would have been a way we might have been able to resolve that, but by time it came to that place on the calendar, that place on the clock, that place on the legislative clock, a decision had to be made. We're we going to bring a bill to the floor of the Iowa House with exceptions, or are we going to have no bill whatsoever? And that was the decision, that was the crux of the matter. And coming to that place of decision, the right decision is, Let's save all the lives we can. Let's take all we can and get as much done as we can. If we could come back with heartbeat after the 20-week bill last year, maybe next year we can come back to eliminate the exceptions or perhaps even do personhood, which is the goal of the pro-life community. It should be that case worldwide. And so I know it was a very difficult decision for some. And uh, I happen to know that Skylar Wheeler may be the most pro-life member of the Iowa House of Representatives, and it was a very difficult decision for him. But with Skylar Wheeler, we got to 51. And we have a bill that then was sent on its way to the governor's desk. And before I mention um, the governor any further, I want to also mention some of the, some of the other help that we had. Um, this, is a, this promise on, on heartbeat legislation is rooted back to a request made by Phyllis Schlafly just days before she passed away that I would draft and introduce heartbeat legislation here in Congress. I followed through on that commitment 
She was, and in a time of her life, a living, breathing icon, the clearest political thinker of our time, a pure constitutionalist, a strong, faithful Christian woman who left her mark and her imprint across this nation in many, many ways. I have powerful respect for Phyllis Schlafly, for her life, for her contribution, for her judgment, and for the promise that I made on the day of her funeral. And I made that promise uh, sitting in, in discussion and consultation with Janet, Por Janet Porter of Faith to Action, who has been the driving force on this, the launching force on this from the beginning, Janet Porter. And Janet Porter now may be the most driven pro-life activist in America, uh, and she's accomplished a lot to get this started and teamed up with Tom DeLay, our former majority leader here, and made his, uh, he made his fame as the whip, who um, may be the best whip that we've ever seen here in the House of Representatives. But both of them worked pro bono on this to move the votes and, and get votes signed up here, in, or, con or uh, co-sponsors signed up here in Congress, which gave a lot of credibility to the, to the heartbeat bill on its way to the Iowa legislature. In addition, one of the pushbacks that we got in the Iowa House was, we don't want to spend taxpayers' money defending this legislation. It's uh, something that they believe that, I mean, uh, some of the folks would say, we will lose in court. So if you know you're going to lose, you can't spend taxpayers' money knowing you're going to lose. My response back to that was, we know we're going to lose at the lower court level. Anybody that argues that that's a reason not to move pro-life legislation is because we'll lose at the district court level, we'll lose at the circuit level. Um, that's a given because we have a strong precedent established by the United States Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade, Doe versus Bolton, and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Of course the lower courts respecting the Supreme Court are not gonna to try to overturn a Supreme Court decision. We have to accept the idea that this will be litigated. It will go through the lower courts. And as it goes into the lower courts, we will lose at each turn until we get to the United States Supreme Court. And to give an example of how this worked in the past, on the ban on partial birth abortion, which came to us about the end of the the end of the 1990s, as I recall, in the initial case, it, it was a ban on partial birth abortion, that gruesome and ghastly procedure that is so so awful to describe it here on the floor of Congress is more than I will do here tonight, Mr. Speaker. But Congress banned that procedure, and having banned that procedure, it was litigated by. Guess what? Planned Parenthood, the uh, the advocacies groups for abortion itself, and the Supreme Court struck down our ban on partial birth abortion. And of course, they have to use a rationale. So their rationale was that the act of a partial birth abortion wasn't precisely enough defined that it was vague. And if it was vague, then how would the abortionist know if he's committing a crime or not? So you're killing a baby. That ought to be enough. But instead, uh, the Supreme Court ruled to strike down our ban on partial birth abortion. They wanted a more precise description of it, and they, they argued that Congress had not established that a partial birth abortion is never medically necessary to save the life of the mother. And so, I arrived in this Congress shortly after that decision. We went to work on this. The um, chairman of the Constitution Committee at that time uh, where I'm the chair of the Constitution Committee today was Steve Shabbat of Cincinnati, a strong pro-life advocate. And we held hearing after hearing in the Constitution Subcommittee. By the way, this, the chairman of the full committee uh, has, was sitting here just a few minutes ago, uh, Mr. Jim Sensenbrenner at that time. So we established through congressional hearings a, and wrote a new ban on partial birth abortion that precisely defined the act of a partial birth abortion that we would prohibit by statute and congressional findings after hearings that it's never necessary to commit this heinous act in order to save the life of the mother. Those congressional findings coupled with the precise definition, we passed the legislation and sent it out again and it was litigated again by let's see, Planned Parenthood, or um, let's see, that was um, uh, what's 
Carhart. Um, Leroy Carhart was the abortionist out of Omaha that was the lead on that case. And um, Carhart versus Gonzalez, as I recall. But in any case, that precise definition that we drafted and the congressional findings that has never been declared necessary to save the life of the mother was enough to get the same court to reverse themselves and accept the conclusions that Congress had drawn because we had conformed to their request. So there's a case where the court came down on the side of, uh, on the side of striking down our ban on partial birth abortion and then we brought it back through the courts again and it was tried in three circuits simultaneously. And in every circuit we lost. But then those the cases were packaged together and they went before the United States Supreme Court. And then we won on the side of life. The court reversed themselves, but we lost at every lower court level. We only had a chance to succeed at the Supreme Court. And that's going to be the case with this legislation as well because it directly challenges Roe versus Wade, Doe versus Bolton, and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So it has to be, it has to get to the Supreme Court. We're going to lose until we get there, when we get there, especially if we arrive in the Supreme Court with a new appointment to the Supreme Court. We're looking at a more likely now, uh, under today's circumstances, the potential of a 5 4. Quarter, uh, a court that would be uh, coming down on the side of the Constitution and the um, strict constructionism that protects life. We're obligated to protect life under the 14th Amendment. And so if Congress can define life, we define it as if a heartbeat is detected, that's life. The baby is protected. And the cost of defending this case isn't going to fall on the backs of Iowa taxpayers, Mr. Speaker. Instead, uh, we, have, um, we have two organizations that have volunteered to step up pro bono to defend this case before the courts. And those two organizations are, uh, this is the message from Matt Staver of Liberty Council, Liberty University, many will know it as, and that's produced a pretty good chief of staff in my operation, that's Sarah Stevens. But Matt Staver has agreed uh, to defend this uh, pro bono, that's Legal, that's Latin for on the house. And um, also Martin Cannon of St. Thomas More Foundation uh, will have agreed that they will also defend it pro bono. So we'll see how this comes together, but it doesn't put the taxpayers of Iowa at risk. And it, so it makes it not only the right decision for life, the right decision for law, the right decision for our Constitution, in particular our 14th Amendment, makes it the right decision for the taxpayers. And when we look at the society we live in today, the last time we had unemployment numbers down as low as we're seeing now, I remember them bringing a bill into the state legislature that re would require all of the health insurance policies in Iowa to cover contraceptives. And one of the arguments they made was, we can't be having women missing work because they're pregnant having babies. We need the labor force too much. Huh. Well, that didn't fit to my analysis at the time, which is why I remember it. Instead, we need babies that will go to work in 18 or 20 years. And we need to sustain ourselves and our society. We need to, I, I tell young people constantly, good people need to have a lot of babies and raise them right. That fixes everything that can be fixed. If good people raise their babies right and have a lot of babies, there will be, there will be enough people here to do the work we need to do and we'll create the jobs for, for others and we will see people picking up and carrying their share of the load, pulling the harness instead of riding in the wagon. That's what saves this society. But in any case, here we are, Mr. Speaker, um, with a bill that passed out of the Iowa House that night on about Wednesday night of last week at 11.30 at night. It might have been Tuesday night, 11.30 at night. May 2nd was, the, let's see, the, then uh, it, it, the, about 11.30 that night, and the dedication of our Iowa senators was such that they said, well, let's just take this up right away. Why don't you carry that across the rotunda, and uh, we'll take it up on the floor of the Iowa Senate. And they did, and after a fairly short debate, they passed it in the Iowa Senate. Again, there was, there was somebody missing, but 29 to... 
um, let's see, I remember the lower number of it, but it passed easily out of the Iowa Senate, and it was a message to the governor that night, which would have been, I believe, May 2nd. So by the time we got around to Friday, I found myself in South Carolina at the invitation of the governor of South Carolina to talk about sanctuary cities, and we ended up doing a press conference also on Heartbeat. Interesting conversation. I think we enjoyed a friendship, and I expect that um, South Carolina was actually had a Heartbeat bill in front of them that was would have been very hard for it to survive reaching the get, the sign a die part of their session because they were about that done. Same with the Sanctuary City Bill. We tried to do what we could with that, but anything that didn't pass down there, I think, comes up again next year, and they've got an extra boost to get that done. And I really appreciate the leadership provided by Governor Henry McMaster on the uh, Sanctuary Cities and on Heartbeat. And uh, we will uh, make sure that we are supportive down there as we have been in Iowa. Also, um, Governor Ricketts of Nebraska said, send me a heartbeat bill, I'll sign it. And uh, I know that there are people in the Nebraska unicameral that are preparing to bring heartbeat in next year in Nebraska. And I know that it's also part of the governor's debate in the race in Florida. So there are other states that are looking as well. This could be something that spreads out across the, across the countryside and state after state after state, Mr. Speaker. But... It wouldn't have this kind of momentum had it not been for Governor Reynolds, who um, had a bill signing ceremony on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock in their formal office in the Capitol and filled the, the office up with lots of, lots of young kids and uh, good, steady, stalwart legislators that deserve a lot of credit and to take a bow for this. And I looked at the pictures of that bill signing ceremony, and it occurred to me that they probably saved as many lives just during the debate for heartbeat as were represented by the children in Governor Reynolds' office. And I thank Governor Reynolds for, uh, for signing the bill and putting it into law. She had put out a statement a week or a little more earlier that said that she's proud to be part of the most pro-life administration in Iowa history. Well, she can now, with, with uh, confidence and, I, and hopefully uh, at least an inner pride, let us know that she's signed the bill and it is makes her it makes governor kim reynolds the most pro-life governor in the history of the state of iowa this accomplishment came about because of the work done by the people i've mentioned here and many many more uh who who worked on this who who prayed for this who relentlessly pushed in the right direction to bring about a bill that could go to the governor's desk. And uh, Governor Reynolds did such a, uh, it was a magnificent bill signing ceremony that sent such a strong message to the rest of the country. And that message to the rest of the country would be this, Mr. Speaker, that Iowa, this purple state, this state that went for, that voted for Barack Obama twice. We also went for Donald Trump, I might add. Um, but Iowa actually launched Barack Obama's campaign for the presidency. He slipped in there from Illinois and got a big bounce in the First of the Nation caucus, and off he went to the presidency and to his reelect as well with strong support out of, out of Iowa. But he won Iowa each time. So prior to President Trump winning in the 2016 election, the time before that that went Republican was George Bush's 2004 re-elect. We worked that hard, and he won Iowa by only 10,000 votes. The other time, the next time prior that Iowa had gone for Republican president was Ronald Reagan's re-elect in 1984. So that's how rare those Iowa victories are. We are a purple state, but Iowa Republicans have put up excellent leadership and the excellent leadership has emerged from a coalesced Republican Party that has been very strong and has hammered out the planks in the platform over and over again. And they ring with utter clarity to me when I read that platform these days, Mr. Speaker. And so I put out this challenge to um, the states and the rest of the country. If Purple State Iowa can pass heartbeat and have the strongest pro-life legislation in the United States of America, of the 50 states, Iowa has the strongest pro-life legislation passed into law, signed by Governor Reynolds. Well, then the challenge is laid out there for the rest of the states. 
see what you can do, take a look at Iowa's legislation, move the cleanest you can, no exceptions is best because that baby's life begins at the moment of fertilization. And we need to protect innocent life from that point on. But we can define the beginning of life medic medically by requiring an ultrasound. And that ultrasound, if it picks up a heartbeat, if a heartbeat is detected, the baby is protected. That phrase rings in the conscience of Americans nationwide. That's why 86% of Republicans support heartbeat HR 490. That's why 61% of independents, and that's why 55% of Democrats do. And by the way, that 55% of Democrats is why no Republican will lose their seat for voting for heartbeat because Democrats won't dare attack you for that. If they do so, they're going against their own base, their own people who are 55% pro-life, even though I can only count about three over here among the, among the Democrats that are pro, that, that, that will be co-sponsors of this legislation, and I think that can define themselves as pro-life. And so I thank all of these individuals that have worked so hard to put uh, this whole strategy together, and I spent some time speaking to the issue, Mr. Speaker, because I want the public to understand that things don't come easy, and good ideas don't just float to the top and sail off to be passed. It takes real work and real organization to get things accomplished and determination and conviction and people that believe. And, um, you know, I look back at um, Dr. John Wilkie, who was a founder, the, the original, uh, original founder of National Right to Life. And that's the oldest and the largest pro-life organization in the country. He said this, when I founded the pro-life movement, it wasn't to regulate how abortions would be done, it was to bring the abortion killing to an end. We have waited too long, and that wait has cost us too much. Close quote. That's Dr. John C. Wilkie, co-founder and former president of National Right to Life. Now, in their, in their um, mission statement, I'm not sure if I have it here in my text, Mr. Speaker, but I'll get it as close as I need to from memory if I don't have it. And uh, National Right to Life's uh, mission statement says that they're dedicated to protecting human life from the beginning of life till natural death. And so the beginning of life raised that phrase, it raised a question with me. So I went through their website to find out how they defined the beginning of life. And they define it on their website, National Right to Life, as from the moment of, fer of fertilization. Life begins at the moment of fertilization, according to National Right to Life, and ends at natural death. I agree with that. I think their mission statement is correct. I think we need to defend life from the, from the moment of fertilization until natural death. And I think National Right to Life should do the same thing. But they believe that we should not challenge the Supreme Court. They believe that we have to accept Roe versus Wade, Doe versus Bolton, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and we have to accept the idea of viability that was framed uh, within, uh, within the Casey decision. And so that's why they've supported the 20-week bill to get up there to the close to the edge of viability, this idea that a 24-week baby can survive outside the womb, a 23-week baby can survive outside the womb, a 22-and-a-half-week baby can survive outside the womb. So under the supposition that we work our way back to um, actually a 21-week baby can survive outside the womb, and I saw data that said a 20-and-a-half-week um, also so the 20 week is marked down there to try to stretch the definition of viability just about as far as they could bring themselves to do so. But they fear challenging the Supreme Court. They're accepting of a Supreme Court decision. Those decisions from 45 years ago, 60 million abortions ago, and they're stuck in the idea that we can't challenge the Supreme Court. Well, how could you not challenge the Supreme Court of the United States? This is the United States Congress. Some teach it as three co-equal branches of government. I've said earlier it's not three. There's a superior branch of government, 
There's a, co there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a branch of government that has the weakest of the three defined by our founding fathers to be the judicial branch of government. And we have a decision that's called Marbury versus Madison that came in in the first years of the 19th century where the Supreme Court asserted their authority to define the Constitution and tell us all what it means. And we've acquiesced to that decision after decision for over 200 years. And how can it be that a, that a Supreme Court of lifetime appointees that conceivably could all be stacked under the terms of one president and live for decades after that and stay on the court after that that could invoke all kinds of havoc on God-given liberties and we would have no way to appeal a decision of the Supreme Court we just have to accept those decisions as if they are the final authority. They're, they're God to us. I say we respect them. I think we respect their jurisprudence. I think we carefully observe what they do. And I think that most of the decisions they make are soundly founded. But some of them are completely wrong. And they have reversed themselves in their own history, which is utter proof that they're completely wrong. And uh, I, would, um, I would point out the clearest one is the Kelo decision. They haven't reversed it yet, but Justice Scalia said he expected it would be reversed at some time. But this was the confiscation of property. The Fifth Amendment of the Constitution guarantees property rights. It says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just, without, without just compensation. The Supreme Court of the United States in the Kelo decision in about 2005 struck those words for public use from the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Now, how can we tolerate a decision like that and accept it because it comes from the Supreme Court? And does it live forever that way? Does the Obergefell decision that out of almost, well, legal rational thought out of nowhere, they impose same-sex marriage on every union in America? How is it that a decision made by either the Iowa Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court has taken away the rights of my sons to be married as husbands and wives. Why does the Supreme Court get to visit with that edict? Because we respect them, we accept those decisions, we don't question them, because the culture is what the culture is. Well, the culture's got to change, and we've got to change our way of looking at this issue of abortion. We cannot sit around and twiddle our thumbs or wait until the Supreme Court is configured differently, but we can do this. We can anticipate it'll be configured differently. We can call upon the Supreme Court to reverse their previous decisions. This idea of stare decisis, the concept that once decided, a subsequent court has to accept the decision made by their predecessors. This Congress can't do that. Well, we can, we don't. We say no Congress can bind a subsequent Congress. No Congress can say you shall appropriate X dollars going into the future and have that be irreversible. All decisions made by our predecessors in previous Congresses and signed by any previous president can be reversed by the United States Congress if it's our will to do that. We don't accept as sacrosanct a decision made by a previous Congress, and neither should we accept a decision as sacrosanct made by a previous Supreme Court. They should all be open to question Yes, we should respect their judgment, their jurisprudence, but we can't allow ourselves to be bound by those decisions, even if we have to go all the way back to challenge Marbury at some point. But we won't have to do that, Mr. Speaker, because I believe the next appointment to the Supreme Court brings a strict constructionist, an originalist to the court, as promised by President Trump. He followed through with Neil Gorsuch, I believe he'll follow through with a second appointment to the court. If given that opportunity, we need to move heartbeat legislation over to the desk of Mitch McConnell so we can begin to apply how we're going to get it off his desk and get it to the floor of the Senate and pass it over to President Trump's desk where he will sign the heartbeat legislation and where the very pro-life vice president, Mike Pence, will be standing next to him when that day happens. All of this needs to unfold here, um, Mr. Speaker, and... The obstruction really comes from the number one pro-life organization, the largest and the oldest, National Right to Life. So I'll put up only, only one poster here, Mr. Speaker, and uh, 
this is uh, this is it. They say National Right to Life says, and this is off of their site, they do not oppose the heartbeat bill. But you know, my utilization of the English language, I don't know the difference between do not do not oppose and do not support. But what we need is support, not this intransigence that's going on, especially when the leadership in this house is essentially given the national right to life and two other organizations who, by the way, support the heartbeat bill, a de facto veto that no pro-life legislation comes to the floor of the House of Representatives unless it is supported by the top three organizations in the country, supported by, does not support. Why? Heartbeat matches their mission statement more closely than anything that they've supported before. And it's drafted with the anticipation that we would get it before the next appointment to the Supreme Court, not this one. And they fear that somehow we're going to lose some ground if we go to the court before the court is ready. And I say I fear for every year we fail to get the heartbeat bill to the Supreme Court, we have on our conscience a million abortions in America taking place, a million little babies not born, a million little pairs of shoes that aren't going to be sitting there by that little bed, by that little crib, a million little children, as innocent as could be, who will never have the chance to live, to love, to learn, to laugh, to play, to fall in love, have children of their own, and raise their children with our American values in their hearts, our faith taught to them, their souls saved and demonstrated here as they lift our country up and the world up with the beliefs and the convictions that were passed to us from God through our founding fathers. And we equivocate on something like this a national right to life stands there, essentially in the way, whether they do not oppose or whether they do not support. Until that changes, this bill does not come to the floor unless the speaker changes his mind, the majority leader changes his mind, and the majority whip changes their mind. And so I call upon national right to life to take a look at Iowa. It may be news to them, Mr. Speaker, that heartbeat past Iowa it'll be litigated it'll be on its way towards the Supreme Court and maybe to the Supreme Court but there's a, there's no acknowledgement that this has happened on the part of national right to life it's as if it didn't happen for them because they can't bring themselves to break out of the mold that they've been stuck in for years this is a 45 year hidebound mold and if it doesn't change it's a million abortions a year, every year, until it does change. This strategy over the last 45 years has cost the lives of 60 million babies. Now, I'm not asserting that it could have been solved and reversed in the first year or two or five or even 10. But along the way, we have to make the case that the Supreme Court, if they don't change, cannot be allowed to be the final word on the lives of another 60 million babies. And so, Mr. Speaker, I urge that uh, first, congratulations to the state of Iowa, the Iowa General Assembly, the Iowa Senate, the Iowa House of Representatives, the Iowa governor, the leadership in the House and in the Senate, all of those who teamed up and joined hands and worked relentlessly and persistently to bring this heartbeat bill uh, through and the signature of Governor Reynolds. God bless them all for the job that they did. May we match their effort and their success here in the United States Congress. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields. The chair lays before the